Hello and welcome to Modelling Misadventures. Now when I was a young boy I had two favourite toys. One was Lego and the other was these. Action Men, or known in America as G.I. Joes. Now I had a number of these and lots and lots of accessories, lots of lots of different outfits, guns, all sorts of things. But one thing I never had was a Jeep that they could drive around in. And I've always had this idea that I'd like to make a one six scale radio controlled Jeep that would fit these action figures. So in this video, I'm gonna take on a little journey where I attempt just that, to make a Jeep radio control that these could drive around in. What do you think about that? Great. I'll see you at the end. On the eve of World War II, the U.S. government, desperate for a general-purpose vehicle, requested submissions from various car companies. The government chose the American Bantam Car Company's design, a lightweight, 60-horsepower, four-wheel drive vehicle with a top speed of 65 miles per hour. So my starting point in trying to make a model of the Jeep was to try and find a 3D printable version of the model online. And I came across this Willys Jeep on the Colts 3D website. Now this was a fairly detailed model of a Jeep, but it was in 1/9 scale, which meant that I would have to scale it up into 1/6 scale in order to make it the right size. But you can see from these pictures that it is a very nice scale representation of a Jeep and it does have a number of very nice details. Now one major problem of this model is that it was designed for static display. You can see here on the chassis that it has a detailed replica of the engine and gearbox but none of this is functional and the model is not intended to drive. So my solution to this problem was to turn to my trusted models of the Land Rover, which are made by 3D sets. Now I've made two versions of this Land Rover before, a short wheelbase version for myself and a long wheelbase version as shown here for my brother. Now these models are fully functional and have a working gearbox, steering and suspension. So my idea was to try and marry these two models together, fitting the Jeep body onto the mechanics of the Land Rover. To start the model off, I scaled up the 3D print parts by 150% which converted them from 1 9th scale to 1 6th scale. Now this meant that they only just fitted on to the print bed. This is the start of the print at the rear of the Jeep's body and you can see that it comes right to the edge of the print bed. Now the other thing about this model is the parts took a very long time to print. This is a readout from the 3D printer just as the rear end of the Jeep was about to finish. And it had been printing for a whopping 
41 hours. But this is what the print looked like after it had been removed from the bed and the supports from under the wheel arches had been taken out. This was the start of the midsection of the Jeep and again this took well over a day to print. Here are some more body parts as they came off the printer. These are the two front wheel arches and the bonnet along with the front grille. Now it was time to start on the parts for the chassis and again these had to be scaled up 150% in order to make them into one sixth scale. I could then start gluing the various body parts onto the chassis. This is how the front wings looked when they were attached. The next part of the model was by far and away the most complicated. I printed out the gearbox, drivetrain, axles and suspension system from the long wheelbase Land Rover. But this could not be attached directly onto the Jeep chassis and body. So there had to be a number of significant modifications. This involved lengthening some of the parts and creating new components that would allow the various parts to attach onto the Jeep body. These are some of the simple components that I created to allow various parts of the Land Rover mechanics to be connected to the Jeep chassis. These simple parts could be glued to one component and then screwed to the other. You can see here that I've used one of these simple parts to create an anchor point underneath the rear wheel arch for one of the rear shock absorbers. I also had to elongate the drivetrain to the rear axles because the Land Rover was only a 1 8 scale model and it had a shorter wheelbase than the Jeep which was a 1 6 scale model. Another problem that I encountered was with the steering servo mount. Now in the Land Rover the steering servo is located right at the front of the chassis but there was no room to put this on the Jeep so I had to create a brand new mount and attach the steering servo to the side of the chassis a little bit further back. So this is where the steering servo ended up just to the side of the gearbox and the motor mount assembly. Now another problem cropped up when I tried to fit the gearbox. It was actually too big and wouldn't fit under the center console in the Jeep cabin. So here I had to use a little bit of creative modeling and I simply cut out a hole to allow the gearbox to fit. I then 3D printed a new cover for this and you'll see later on in the video that the end result is actually pretty satisfactory. I then got to work on trying to create a functional bonnet. On the Jeep model the bonnet was not intended to be raised and there was no hinge. So I modified this, cut out a slot and inserted a hinge so that it could be raised and lowered. Once I was happy that the mechanical parts of the Land Rover could be attached to the body of the Jeep, I disassembled everything and started to paint the model. So I started off by spraying everything with a coat of white primer. I then sprayed the model green and for this I used cans of Tamiya spray paint Olive Drab 2. This is what the parts looked like when they had all received two to three coats of green spray paint.
Once everything had been painted, it was time to put it all back together again. And this is what it looked like with all the mechanical components married on to the body of the Jeep. Because of the position of the steering servo, I had to use an angled horn to transmit the forward and backward direction of the servo into the sideways motion required to operate the steering mechanism. This shows the position of the motor, gearbox and steering servo in the front part of the Jeep. And the motor is nestled between the two front shock absorbers, which is not part of the original design of either the Jeep or the Land Rover, but it was a modification to make everything fit. So here's the basic shell of the Jeep with all the mechanical parts added on. So now on to the wheels. Now these were 3D printed from the Jeep model, but they wouldn't fit onto the axles of the Land Rover. So I had to print out part of the Land Rover wheel and glue it to the interior of the Jeep wheel. And this actually uh, came out exactly the right size. Now that the four wheels have been attached, it's actually starting to take the shape of a real Jeep. At this point, I just could not resist the temptation of test fitting the bonnet, the windscreen, and one of my action man action figures. And this seemed like a really exciting moment because for the first time, I finally realized my dream of having a Jeep that was actually big enough for the action man to sit in. So once that little flurry of excitement was out of the way, it was time to get on with printing some of the additional details. And here we have the front grille. And here are the seats. Here's a selection of the interior and exterior details after they've been painted. And these allowed us to finish off the basic structure of the Jeep, which is now coming along very, very nicely. For the next phase, I needed to get the markings onto the Jeep. And for this, I ordered some stencils from the United Kingdom that were specifically designed for a 1 6th scale Jeep. You can see that a fair amount of masking was required here before the model could be sprayed in a white paint. And this was the end result, which I was actually really happy with. The star on the bonnet looks amazing. There is a little bit of bleeding alongside the lettering, but I wasn't too concerned about that because I think it actually added to the overall realism. I then got to work on some of the interior details and it became clear to me that the 3D printed steering wheel that was provided with the Jeep was far too thick. Now I did consider trying to redesign this uh, in the 3D print files themselves but I wasn't able to do that. So again I did it the old fashioned way and I filed it down and filled it and sanded it until I got the effect that I was looking for. I then had to figure out a way of fastening the hubcaps on in such a way that they could be removed uh, if the wheels ever had to be taken off. And I decided to do this just by putting some Velcro on the wheel and on the hubcap. Now real Willys Jeeps have a shovel and an axe attached to the side of the body, but these did not come as part of the 3D print files with the Jeep model. So I had to locate these elsewhere on the internet and I found some examples on Thingiverse. Now the next question was, could I make the handles look like real wood? Well, in order to do this, I first of all 
painted the handles in a base coat of yellow. I then painted over the top with a brown oil paint to try and recreate the grain of the wood. And I think the end result actually turned out to be pretty good. Now with all the parts more or less completed, my attention now turned to the topic of weathering. Now weathering is something that I'd had very little experience of. And I knew that there was a danger that if I got it wrong, it would make a complete mess of the model. So I started off by doing some weathering tests and I printed out this test piece of plastic, painted it in the base coat green and on the left side I sprayed it with some clear varnish. Now I knew I was going to do the weathering with oil paints but there's a lot of discussion on the internet about how the oil paints should be diluted. With some thinners, you can actually damage the surface of the paint job. So I tested four different thinners. I tested Humbrol enamel thinners, Tamiya lacquer thinner, some white spirits, and Zippo lighter fluid. I made up four separate solutions of the oil paint that I was going to use for the weathering, each in a different thinner, and to a concentration of about 1 in 20. And this is how I apply them to my test piece. At the top was Humbrol enamel thinners, followed by the Tamiya lacquer thinners, followed by the white spirits, and at the bottom, the Zippo lighter fluid. And in the cells down the left hand side, the paint had been covered with a clear coat of varnish. Whereas on the right hand side, the paint was just exposed as normal. The results were pretty clear cut. On this test piece here, the two cells at the top had not been weathered at all. The two below that had been weathered in paint diluted in humbrol enamel thinners and this had severely degraded the surface of the paint and it didn't matter whether the paint had been protected with the varnish or not it just took the surface off and the same thing happened with the Tamiya lacquer thinners and to a lesser extent with the white spirits although the clear coat of varnish did seem to protect the paint from damage due to this thinner. But the best thinner of all was the Zippo lighter fluid and you can see in the bottom two cells that this has made the paint seem duller but it has not damaged the surface at all. Now that I decided on the method of weathering that I was going to use I got to work on weathering all the various components and the results came out very nice. I was actually very happy with the end result. We were now getting down to the finishing touches. This is one of the front headlights which was 3D printed and painted but I made a glass cover for this light using a Perspex Christmas tree bauble that was scored with a scalpel knife to make it look more realistic. The last thing I wanted to make was some cushions for the seats. These were manufactured out of a flat sheet of plastic covered by a couple of layers of foam and then covered with some green material. And I had to get my wife's assistance here to stitch the tiny cushions into shape. And this is how they turned out. The final piece of the jigsaw for this model was going to be the action figure that sat inside it and I'd actually got a brand new action figure specifically for this purpose and this was a highly detailed 1-6 scale action figure of an American Ranger soldier typical of those that landed at Normandy in 1944. Now, as with the rest of the Jeep, I wanted to weather 
this action figure's clothes to make him more realistic. But I had no idea how to do this, so as usual I turned to the internet for advice. And I found this method that involved using rubbing alcohol and soft pastel chalks. And what this involved was moistening the cloves initially with the alcohol and then gently rubbing them with various colours of chalk to achieve the desired effect. And this was the end result with the cloves and boots and backpack and accessories now covered in mud and looking much more typical of what they would have been like in real life. A bit of weathering on the gun and the entire project was now complete. Well, there we have it. That's how I managed to make my one six scale radio control Jeep. All that remains now is for me to say goodbye and I will let you enjoy the following pictures. Bye for now and see you next time.